So in this video, we're going to start looking at scriptable tools. And scriptable tools are awesome. Uh, they're a relatively recent feature of Unreal. Uh, so if we go to the docs and have a little look at the scriptable tools documentation, uh, what we can see is that scriptable tools is an experimental feature that allows uh, non-C++ programmers to build interactive tools in the editor. So it's a little bit like edit utilities, if you're familiar with those. Um, if you're coming from Houdini uh, and you don't have much experience with Unreal, this might be a bit of a sort of a new topic for you. But if you're a Houdini user coming to Unreal, this is exactly the kind of complementary skill set that's going to sort of empower you to make better tools. So it's really worth your time. In order to build scriptable tools, we need to first go and make sure that we have the required plugins enabled. So I'm going to go to the plugins and let's just have a little look for scriptable tools. You can see that there's two plugins here, Scriptable Tools Editor Mode and Scriptable Tools Framework. So we're going to turn both of these on. And you're going to see that we have to restart the Unreal Engine for this to take effect. All right, so now the Scriptable Tools uh, plugin has been enabled. You can just go ahead and verify that that is indeed the case. So we go Scriptable Tools. We can see that they're both on now. Uh, if we right click inside of our content browser and go down to Editor Utilities, you see that we have the option to create something called an Editor, editor Utility Blueprint, which is what we want to do. And we're going to go not with any of the sort of predetermined options here. We're going to click all classes and then we're going to search scriptable and we'll see that we have a few options. We have scriptable click and drag, interactive tool and single click tool. So to begin with, let's just go with the scriptable tool, single click tool. That's kind of a basic, a basic version of the tool. And let's call this tool. Uh, let's go with tool landscape or pathfinding tool pathfinding landscape splines there we go so we're gonna make a few different tools throughout the course of this series if we open up the tool now you're going to be confronted with this blueprint uh, kind of viewport and also if you go up to the selection mode now you're going to see that there's a new entry right at the bottom below all of these other default unreal modes called scriptable tools and you should already see that inside of the custom tools pane we have a tool called tool and that is the tool that we've just made we can change the name of the tool if we're on class default. So what I'm going to do is call this, uh, let's call this splines just to be simple. And we're going to put it into a category called Pegasus. And then if we go ahead and minimize that, if we close and reopen scriptable tools mode, you can see now that we have a, a menu called Pegasus and splines. And with the spline mode selected, if we select it, we can see that we enter this kind of custom mode called splines. We can end the mode and we can restart it like so also hit, hit escape uh, and when we click on it we get this parameter pane uh, but it currently doesn't have anything inside of it so what we want to do is first of all just look at how can we get the parameter inside of this pane and the parameter that we want to put here is going to be the name of the file on disk that we want to load into unreal so we're going to sort of recreate some of the functionality that exists on this Houdini asset actor. In fact, we're still going to use the same exact Houdini digital asset. We're just going to wrap it inside of a nicer user experience with uh, additional sort of blueprint scripting capabilities around it. So let's go ahead and uh, look, we want to create a sort of file parameter. And the way that we can create a parameter on a scriptable tool that appears in this menu here is going to require us to create a new blueprint class and this is going to be a class of the type property set. So we're looking for an interactive tool or a scriptable interactive tool property set or an editor scriptable interactive tool property set. I'm not actually sure which one we want. So I'm going to go ahead and click Edit Utilities, Edit Utility Blueprint, and then I'm going to search for property sets in here and see if that helps. Uh, property, narrow it down. I think editor scriptable interactive tool property set is the one we're after. So I'm going to call this property set. Um, load or yeah load or file well, let's just call it landscape splines there we go and then we're going to create a variable on here and we're going to call it uh, we're going to make sure that it's of type file path and then we're going to call this uh bgo file bgo file there we go we need to click this little eye over here on the right um which is making this public or visible and you can see that when I take the eye also on the right over here, uh, it's becoming instance editable. So we can now see uh, this as a, as a public variable. So we can compile and save. So we've created our property set and we now need to attach the property set to the tool. And you might be wondering, why do we not just create the property on the tool directly as if we were creating a digital asset? 
uh, inside of Houdini? Well, the reason for that is because this allows property sets to be shared between multiple tools, which is quite useful. Okay, so we go to our tool and inside of our tool, we're looking at this kind of empty graph um, and we want to basically find an event that we can cause the property set uh, to be attached to the tool by. Um, so we're going to go to the functions. I'm going to click override. We're going to see we have a bunch of de default events that we can sort of create logic from. And we want to use the on script setup. So that means when this tool starts, we want to do something. I'm going to go and add a property set of type. And the type that we want to add is the property set landscape splines that we created. We don't need to change the identifier because for now we only have one property set. And uh, a weird peculiarity of uh, this system in Unreal is we do actually just need to go ahead and cast this to the correct type of property set. So this doesn't, re doesn't actually uh, return any information about what the property set does or contains until we cast to it. Okay, so now we've added the property set and we've cast to it. We can promote that property set to a variable and we can just leave that default name of property set landscape splines. Okay, so this isn't strictly necessary um, to actually get the, pro the parameters to appear on the tool, um, but this will then allow us to get information about those parameters inside of this uh, script here, inside of this blueprint, and sort of do stuff with that information. So I'm going to head and click save. I'm going to load up the spline tool, and now you can see that we get our BGO file uh, here listed in the uh, parameter pane when we activate the tool. So close the tool, the parameter disappears, open the tool, there we can see it. So this is a context sensitive menu here. Okay, so we also get this nice little uh, choose file picker, uh, which we're familiar with. Um, so that's going to be nice. Um, but let's make sure that we can actually tell if the tool is even doing anything or even working uh, to begin with. So basically, we want to check, uh, we want to basically get tell the tool to do something when we modify the input to this uh, parameter here. So how are we going to do that? Well, we can go and do uh, another sort of override another script thing, uh, another script uh, event, and that's going to be on script tick. So on script tick runs every single frame that the tool is currently active. So while the tool is running, this is going to be doing something continuously. And we can test this by just doing a little print string, compile and save, and then let's go ahead and activate the tool. And you can see it's now just printing hello every single tick. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and clear the log and we can see that disappears after a little while. So we don't want to print hello. We actually want to print the name of the file that we've selected. So we're going to get our property set variable. So we're getting uh, as property set landscape spline. We can just drag and get like so. And then uh, we can get the value of BGO file. So we're going to drag out of this pin and we're going to do get BGO file. And then I think if we break the file path, we can see that this is now going to return the string that we can print. Uh, and because it created such a long list of outputs before, uh, which I, I didn't really want, it, it, I'm going to go ahead and change the duration that this has printed the string for from two seconds down to 0 0.01, which means we're just going to have a single entry that continuously sort of appears to get updated. So we're gonna go ahead and compile and save. We're gonna go ahead and click the spline tool. And actually, you can see that the output log is, is working, but this is not appearing in the string. So maybe I'm going to go ahead and set the duration a little bit higher to 0.1 instead. And it's still not still not displaying it. Oh, and I know why. It's because we don't actually have anything selected. So uh, if we go ahead now and go and find uh, that file that we want to load, you can see that it's now going to actually print the name of the file. So this is good. It's getting the correct file the file extension and everything uh, so we can use this later on in the tool. So we can remove the print string, but we want to keep this little bit of logic, uh, which is actually going to get the file we want to load. Uh, and now what we want to do is basically procedurally instantiate this Houdini BGO import. So we're no longer going to just sort of manually place it into the level. We're going to handle the lifetime of that actor via the tools pane. Uh, so that's going to require us to use the uh, the Houdini uh, engine API inside of Blueprints. All right. So how can we start? How can we start doing that? Well, if you want to look at some examples of uh, of this in action without before this tutorial, you can go ahead and sort of navigate to uh, the Houdini engine plugin, and you can take a look inside of the examples folder, and you can have a look at the editor uh, utility actions and editor utility widgets example. If we jump inside of here looks maybe slightly intimidating if you're new to blueprints, but don't worry, we're going to be going very step by step. 
you can see that we have uh, this option here uh, to instantiate an ash asset via uh, the blueprints. Um, so this is basically what we're going to be trying to do. Uh, and then <clears throat> we're also going to be sort of running certain logic, like setting parameters on the digital asset. Uh, and of course, eventually even cooking the asset. So let me see if I can find where that might be. Um, I'm going to control F and type recook or cook. Uh, so let's go ahead and see if I can find it. Actually, I'm going to search for the wrapper. Uh, there we go. So if I find all of the references to wrapper, get wrapper. Oh, there's too many of these things here. I'm just trying to find the cook actually. Um, okay, this is a this is an exercise in futility, so we're not going to worry about this. But the point being, uh, we can do things with digital assets through blueprints. Uh, we also can see here that they're actually in, in initializing the Houdini engine session as well, or they're checking to see if it's currently initialized and then they're running it. Okay, so we want to do something similar, and the digital asset that we want to instantiate is the digital asset which is responsible for spawning uh, and sort of cooking uh, and loading a BGO, uh, which is this Houdini BGO import digital asset. So let's go back back into uh, the tool and let's just go ahead and search for instantiate. We can see that we're not actually finding anything yet. So this right click search pane inside of Unreal is context sensitive. So let's see if we can find anything relating to Houdini first of all. Okay, so we can see a bunch of stuff. Um, we can see lots of casting, which isn't interesting. We can see a couple of subsystems, which may be useful. But the thing specifically that's interesting to me right now is this get Houdini engine public API. And this is what allows us to uh, access all of the uh, kind of Houdini engine functions like instantiate asset. But as we saw in the example, we're not going to be able to instantiate or do anything with an asset unless there is already a Houdini session running. Uh, so first of all, let's search for session and we'll see if there is a valid session. We'll do a branch, okay? And this is basically saying, if there is a session already, then we can continue. If there isn't a session already, then what we can do, and by the way, I'm just clicking R. When I have got when I move my mouse somewhere and click R, I can create a reroute node like so to keep things a little bit tidier. Um, so if there is not already a valid session, then I'm gonna, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go ahead and click create session. There we go. So it does actually say <laughs> that uh, it's only going to create a new Houdini session if there is no current session. So this branch might be redundant, but I can see they used it in the example and I don't want it to break. So I'm going to copy their example. All right. So then I'm going to wire this in here because we can assume at this stage that the session has been created. Now, this also might be redundant, but I found that Houdini in Unreal and things can start to get a little bit sort of locked up if you try to do too many operations at once. Uh, and it can be helpful to sort of stagger events using this little delay until next tick function that is blueprint native. So this just means that we're going to make sure that at least one frame has cleared um, before, or at least this, 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 this CPU kind of process has been unlocked um, and now we can do uh, something else. So we're gonna delay a tick and we're gonna instantiate uh, a new asset there we go. And the asset that we're going to instantiate is going to be the Houdini BGO import. Okay. Now I don't want this to automatically cook at all. I want to control the cooking programmatically via blueprints. So I've turned off in enable auto cook. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and hit compile. Okay. So we're not getting any errors yet. And if you remember, the one parameter that we needed to set on the Houdini BGO import was the target file BGO that we wanted to load. So uh, let's set that parameter now. So the way we can do set parameters on the digital asset procedurally is we can go set uh, par, par to find all this, the options that we've got. And there's quite a lot of options here. Um, we can set sort of uh, all, many parameters at the same time using set input parameters. Uh, we can set parameters of different types, uh, like tuples. So that's kind of like floats or vectors. Um, we can set individual floats, bo booleans. Um, but the one that we're only really interested in right now is the set string parameter. And this just requires us to know the name of the parameter that we want to set. So let's go ahead and instantiate the BGO once more. Let's go and find the name of the parameter. So it is just, uh, we're not looking for the name, which is geometry file. We're actually looking for the part that's in the braces. So just lowercase, all lowercase file. So the parameter that we want to change is gonna be called file, like so. 
can go ahead and delete this VGO once more to clear up the scene. And the value that we want to set on the string parameter value is going to be the file path, like so. Okay, so in theory now, uh, we're instantiating an asset, and once it's been instantiated, we're setting the string parameter value. Let's give this a test, and we'll see if we run into any issues. So we're going to go ahead and hit compile. <laughs> and I can tell you already, there would have been a pretty significant issue. And that issue is that we are currently, we're about to run this logic on, uh, on script tick, which means it would be trying to run it every single frame. We definitely do not want to do that. That's going to cause all sorts of uh, pain. Uh, it would have probably instantiated a bajillion assets and crashed our PC. So what we're going to do instead is create a button on the tool that's going to allow us to decide when we want to uh, instantiate the asset, okay? So that's going to require us to go back to the location of the property set and create a button. So the way that we create a button is we're going to right click and go custom event and we're going to say uh, load file, okay? So we created our event and then uh, just like we did with the parameter, we're going to need to make this public so we can say uh, call in editor like so. And actually, it's already set to public, so that's good. And we need a way to now pass this event uh, firing over to the blueprint, so over to the tool. So this is, again, sort of very Unreal specific stuff. It's a little bit weird, but it makes sense once you get your head around it. And the way that we can do this is we can create an event dispatcher, okay? So we're going to create a new event dispatcher. I'm going to call this load file as well, okay? We can't do that, so we're going to say file load or dispatch <laughs> load file, there we go. So what we can do is we can drag this in and we can call dispatch load file after the load file event. And if we go back to our pathfinding tool, we can now, uh, as the property set landscape spline, uh, we can get the um, load file, uh, here we go. So, and what we want to do is we want to bind the event to dispatch load file, okay. So this is basically saying uh, when load file happens, uh, we want to run this event that we're creating and we're gonna call this load file or even recook HDA, there we go. It's probably better. Okay, now right now this binding isn't happening because you can see there's an execution pin that needs to come into the bind event. And we're just going to do that on script startup and because it's going to happen, actually, yeah, let's just do this, create a little bit of space. We're gonna call this uh, bind events. So I press, press C to create a comment box around that. And I'm gonna make it a nice dark gray so it's less, less annoying. And I'm just gonna save that color up there because I like this color, I'm gonna use it a lot. Okay, so we're gonna call this bind events and we're gonna call this add property sets because it pays to be organized down the, down the road. And now this recook HDA is where we're going to fire off all of this logic, okay? And this is actually incorrect. This is not when we're recooking the HDA. This is actually right now the instantiate HDA function, okay? So here we go. Let's have a little look at what happens when we uh, load up the tool now, when we hit the button that we've created, uh, and um, yeah, let's just see what goes on. So we click on the spines tool, and uh, it looks like we're not actually seeing the event being passed over to the tool. So what have I missed?